to Ocean First Institute's Are Sharks Smart? Diving into the brains of sharks and their relatives. We are so honored and excited to have Dr. Kara Yopak with us today. We're gonna to meet her in just a few minutes, but before we get started, I wanted to share just a little bit about Ocean First Institute for those of you that are new to, it, new to us. I'm Jenna Oliver, I'm the Director of Development at Ocean First Institute. Here at Ocean First Institute, our goal is conservation through research and education. We are so passionate about the ocean and hope to inspire every one of you to be equally as passionate about the wonders of the ocean as we are. We are dedicated to educating and empowering young people to become the future leaders in conservation. So please join us in that effort by visiting our website and following us on social media. For the webinar today, please feel free to type questions in the Q&A box or in the chat section of the Facebook Live broadcast. And Dr. Yopak will address them after her presentation. Now I would like to introduce you to my boss and Ocean First Institute's Executive Director, Dr. Mickey McComb Kobza. All right, uh, well, thank you, Jenna. Um, welcome everybody. I'm so uh, glad to see so many of you coming into the, uh, to the webinar, so welcome. Thank you so much for the support. Um, we are so excited today uh, to have Dr. Kara Yopak joining us. Um, I'll give you a, a little introduction uh, to Dr. Yopak, but before I do, I'll just like to say that the first time that I met her uh, was at a scientific conference, and I sat in the audience and watched her give um, a talk uh, about shark brains, and uh, it was a, an award-winning talk. She won the award, the highest award that our uh, society gives, and uh, everybody in the audience was completely blown away. So she is an amazing speaker, an amazing researcher um, and a good friend. So I'm really excited to have her here with us today. Um, she is the assistant, uh, an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina in Wilmington. Um, and she got her uh, bachelor's from Boston University. Uh, and she got her PhD at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. How amazing is that? And then she continued on to do uh, postdocs at uh, University of California, San Diego, and also the University of Western Australia. So she gets uh, around, you can see that. Um, her research is fascinating, and it has focused on comparative neurobiology and the adaptive developmental and phylogenetic forces acting on the evolution of the brain. Um, particularly within the cartilaginous fishes. So she's going to be speaking to us today about her continuing um, and really groundbreaking research on sharks, skates, and rays, and their, uh, their brains, what their brains are uh, like, and how uh, that translates into perhaps uh, intelligence. And so are sharks smart? So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Kara Yopak. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. And thank you guys all for coming. I'm really excited to have the chance to speak with you all today. Uh, even if it has to be in a bit of a virtual setting, um, I think it's fantastic you all came out to hear about the wonders of the brain. So I brought my brain, hopefully you guys all brought yours. Um, so, however, I don't study the brains of this. Um, I study the brains of the cartilaginous fishes. So I'm just gonna share my screen. Get started, okay. Excellent. So Looks hopefully good. everybody can see that, fantastic. Uh, great. So I, um, as um, Dr. McComb said, I'm Dr. Carrie Yopak, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. And I think I have the best job in the world, um, which is I get to work with sharks every single day. Um, but I think I also win the Weirdest Job Award because I study their brains, which is admittedly pretty strange. Um, so not knowing necessarily who my audience was, um, I wanted to kind of do a little bit of a Google search about some preconceived notions you guys might have about people like me who study brains. Uh, so the wonders of Google basically produced a lot of images like this. Um, essentially, um, brain scientist equates to mad scientist. 
uh, I am apparently sitting in my lab with steaming beakers, wearing crazy clothes and crazy hair, sort of laughing maniacally over the key ingredients to a mad scientist toolkit, jars and jars of brains. Uh, so while I'm going to admit I do have jars and jars of brains, we actually hit over a thousand jars of brains earlier this year. Um, what I'm hoping that you guys will get out of this is that looking at the brain across species can actually help us understand behavior and ecology and can even be informative about our own neuroanatomy. So like I said, I'm lucky enough to study um, the brain of sharks. Um, which are part of a group called the cartilaginous fishes. So some of you may not know, essentially we've got over 1200 species of cartilaginous fish. This is going to include sharks, of course, also skates, rays, and a funny group called chimeras. Um, and they have a skeleton that's made entirely of cartilage, which is where they get their name. Now, when most people think about a shark, chances are you're picturing this guy. I think we can all identify this species and shout it in our living room. This is, of course, the white shark. Um, pretty charismatic, um, not really hard to see why. He's star of stage and screen, um, incredibly photogenic, and happens to often catch the attention of the media. Uh, as do a number of his friends, species like the tiger shark, which has that kind of characteristic pattern running along their body, or the bull shark, who are pretty unique because they can swim upstream um, into rivers. I personally am just as fascinated, I will call them the weird and wonderful species. So animals like a spiny dogfish, small-bodied sharks that live near the seafloor, pretty, pretty much found worldwide. Um, the fastest swimming shark in the ocean, like the mako shark, for example. I also really love the true weirdos, so the ones with sort of morphological or behavioral specializations, so like the whale shark, which is the largest fish in the ocean, um, or the great hammerhead, which has that incredible cephalofoil, and then there's species we still don't know a lot about. Um, so species like the Greenland shark, they live under the ice in the Arctic. So what I would love to do is actually just talk to you about cool sharks and what makes them awesome for two hours. Um, but like I said, we have got tw over 1200 species that's going to encompass an awful lot of diversity. So what my lab does and the kind of questions I focus on is do we similarly see that kind of diversity in their brain? Now, when people find out that I study the brains of sharks, uh, they will usually ask me this one inevitable question. And this almost always comes up, especially if they've seen the movie Deep Blue Sea. You probably had a clue to it because it was in my title. Um, that question is, are sharks smart? And I'm gonna be really honest, it's actually my least favorite question in the world. Um, because if you think about it, it's, it's a really difficult thing to quantify. So what does it actually mean to be smart? On top of that, I think sharks have a reputation for being kind of dumb, right? They're the pre-programmed eating machines that we, we see in movies. Um, but actually, uh, sharks are capable of a wide range of pretty amazing behaviors. And as you probably saw, if you've been tuning into some of the other lectures in this series, they have this incredible battery of highly developed sensory systems that they use to sample their world around them. So just like you and me, imagine you're a shark and you're swimming through your environment. You're going to be continuously sampling odor cues, um, gathering things that you see in your environment. You might be surprised to know sharks can actually hear and respond to sounds. They also have a few unique senses, uh, so they can detect um, minute electric fields via these special organs called the electroreceptors, and they can sense water motion around their body using their lateral line. So I want you to imagine as you're swimming through, this vast array of sensory information is being continuously sampled and then sent to the central nervous system or brain for processing. And this is where we come in. Now, in my experience, we've got some misconceptions about a shark brain as well. Um, the biggest one being that sharks are primitive, small-brained animals. But 
there was actually some fantastic research done in the 1970s that refuted this. So this is actually a figure that started my whole PhD and it's showing relative brain size across all major groups of vertebrates. So from mammals, which we are a part of, to birds, to reptiles, to bony fish. And I want you just to focus on this group in yellow. So this is the cartilaginous fish. So what this paper in 1970 showed was that they're not actually small brained animals. They have relative brain sizes that are comparable to birds and mammals. Blew my mind. Um, as a baby PhD student, what was the most incredible thing about this is that it was based on only 12 species. So remember, we got over 1,200 species of cartilaginous fish. So this finding was based on only 1% of the cartilaginous fish described to date. So since that time, uh, work done by myself and my students and wonderful collaborators, we've expanded this polygon in all directions. So we're showing an even greater overlap um, in terms of relative brain size with other vertebrate groups. So this is gonna range in everything from the tiny cookie cutter shark all the way up to the manta ray, which actually has the largest brain um, in terms of relative size of any species um, that has been examined yet. Now I wanna dig a little bit deeper into this data set. Uh, I know for a lot of people, they have this idea that if you're a shark biologist, you're spending every minute on a boat with white sharks breaching all around you. The truth is most of us spend our days in the lab. Um, and if you're me, you spend most of your time looking at graphs like this. So what this graph is showing you is we've got log brain mass here on the y-axis and log body mass on the x. And each of these yellow dots that you see is a different shark species. And if we do some statistics, this line that's just come across is what we call the best fit line. And the way you can interpret that is this is sort of the brain size that we expect that animal to have of a given body size. So if one of these yellow dots sits above the line, it has a larger than expected brain for its body size. And if the dot sits below the line, it's gonna have a smaller than expected brain for its body size. So what you can notice is that in general, the trend is showing that brain size increases as body size increases, but we have a lot of variability within that trend. So you will have some species like a swell shark um, and they have a much smaller than expected brain for their body size. Um, others like say a hammerhead has a much larger than expected brain for its body size. So what does that mean? Um, so historically speaking, Larger brain species tend to live in more complex habitats. Um, they tend to hunt more strategically and they tend to have sort of more complex social structure. Smaller brain species tend to live in less complex habitats and hunt a little bit more opportunistically. Um, but what kind of difference in brain size are we talking about here? Um, what does that graph actually mean in terms of scale? So most people, if they've ever seen a shark brain before, you've probably seen this one. Um, this is the brain of the spiny dogfish. Um, pretty common ubiquitous species, also tends to be the one people dissect in biology class. Um, if we were to just focus on the spiny dogfish though, you really would not be getting a sense of the morphological variety you can see in the brains of these animals, which is pretty considerable. So comparing our spiny dogfish brain to the one next to it, like a mako shark brain, and then comparing our mako shark brain to something like a hammerhead shark brain. So we're talking about considerable differences in brain size. But as you're looking at these, I also want you to notice they're not just the same brain that's scaled up. The brain actually is made up of a bunch of different components. And those components are also going to vary in size. So we're gonna introduce you to a few major brain regions and we're gonna start with my favorite. So one part of the brain I find ridiculously fascinating is something called the cerebellum. Uh, hopefully those of you tuning in have at least heard about this structure because you have one. So it sits right at the base of your brain on your slide, it's shown there in blue. 
cool fact. Um, sharks were actually the first to have a cerebellum. Uh, and it's been carried through vertebrate evolution all the way from sharks to you and me. Another thing I find really interesting about this structure is that we still don't know what it does. So we have a lot of research in this area. We know some of what it does, but there's not a full functional understanding yet. So there's evidence that says um, this structure kind of moderates motor control and motor learning. There's other research that says it's involved in target tracking and even sensory acquisition. So I just want to highlight the debate, but for the purposes of today, we're just going to kind of consider both of those views. Okay, so like I said, just like you and me, we can break the brain of a shark down into different major regions. And those regions are going to have different functional association. So they're going to do a different thing for the animal. So get ready for the fastest neuroanatomy lesson in the history of neuroanatomy lessons. Strap in. First, we have what are called the olfactory bulbs. So these receive input from the olfactory epithelium, which is essentially like the soft stuff that lines the inside of our nose. Um, so the olfactory bulbs are associated with processing smells. Next, we have something called the telencephalon. This is involved in things like spatial learning and memory. The mesencephalon, which receives input from the eye and the retina, is associated with vision. Cerebellum, again, motor control and or target tracking. Interesting structures called cerebellar-like structures. These receive input from the animal's electroreceptors and lateral line. And then finally, we have the medulla, um, which communicates with the spinal cord uh, and is involved in homeostasis. So bearing all this in mind, the big question for my lab then is, okay, can the enlargement or recession of these individual brain regions be related to where these animals live and senses that they may need to specialize in to be successful in those environments that they're inhabiting? So answering this requires the um, fieldwork component of what I do. So this is me hard at work. Uh, although I have to be honest, most of the time it's my students who get to go out into the field. Um, but you can see from this picture, they're sometimes kind enough to take me along. Um, so we've been lucky enough to sample um, and examine the brains of over 180 species. So that's roughly about 15% of species described to date. And in this data set, we have got closely related species to distantly related species. We have species that swim at different speeds, that eat different things, um, that reproduce in different ways, and then, of course, live in different environments. So now that you have a little bit of an understanding of what some of these brain regions do, I kind of want to go back to this slide. Um, because you can sort of start to make sense of what enlargement of some of these structures might mean. So on the left, we have the brain of our spiny dogfish. Um, and in my analysis, what we found is that this is sort of what I'll call the average brain. So in other words, nothing's particularly enlarged um, or particularly stands out. If you compare that to the um, short fin mako shark, what really stands out um, in their brain is incredibly large regions associated with vision, differing again from a hammerhead, which has really large regions for things like spatial learning and memory and a really large cerebellum. Again, all that debate, but motor control and target tracking. So the big take home from this is that these animals all share the same brain structures, but that they really can vary in terms of size. But because this is science and nothing's ever easy, it's not just about size. So another feature that we have to look at is complexity. Um, and in particular, something that varies a lot in the cerebellum of sharks is the amount of folding, or I'll call it foliation, of that structure. So I'm going to introduce you to something called the foliation index. This is super simple. It's just a visual grading method of one to five. So one is going to correspond to a smooth cerebellum surface, increasing in length, depth, and number of folds till you get a grade of five. And you can see that's pretty deep branched grooves um, like that of our hammerhead here. And then we can apply this to all of our species. Okay, hopefully I've convinced you we have all of this variation and each of these structures has different functional associations. So what might be some explanations for this variation? 
Um, to understand that, we need to start to talk about ecology. Uh, and I am aware that not everyone spends as much time thinking about what's going on under the surface of the ocean as I do. Um, so I like to think of the undersea world kind of like a graph. So I want you to imagine if we've got increasing depth on the y-axis and then a range of microhabitats within each of those depth strata. So we're gonna talk through some basic patterns um, that we've seen in the brains of these animals um, from a range of studies. And again, bearing in mind, this is gonna be a broad generalization across those 180 species. If anybody wants to talk about a specific species, we can definitely um, handle that in the Q&A. But we're just gonna talk about broad patterns for now. And we're gonna start with benthic sharks. So benthic sharks tend to spend most of their time resting on the seafloor. And we find them everywhere. So we find benthic sharks in the deep sea, we find them on the continental shelf, and we even find them hanging around coral reefs. If we first look at the foliation or folding of their cerebellum, again, one is that smooth cerebellum surface, five is super folded. Um, pretty much all the benthic sharks I've looked at have low levels of foliation. And if we think about the cerebellum being involved in motor control and target tracking, this does make sense because we're probably looking at animals that don't move around too much. Now, in addition to similar patterns of foliation, we see similar patterns in what's enlarged in their brains. Um, and that being said, not a lot. Uh, so they have that kind of average brain development. There's been some very interesting research in bony fishes. We actually know a lot more about bony fish brains than we do the cartilaginous fish brains. Um, and they've suggested that average brains um, in bony fishes may actually lend itself to being more ecologically flexible. So the same could very well be true of our benthic sharks, where this average brain development may actually allow for an ecological flexibility um, which could make them more successful in their environment. Okay, those are benthics. Let's talk about benthopelagics. So these are the sharks that are associated with the bottom, but they spend most of their time sort of cruising just off the seafloor. And this is where we start to see differences in relation to microhabitat. So we are gonna go into the deep sea. So I want you to imagine we are going thousands of meters below the surface of the water, and we are experiencing an environment with very low light levels, very cold temperatures, and prey and other sharks that you might want to mate with are gonna be pretty scarce. In the species that we find there, again, starting first with foliation, pretty much all of the deep sea sharks I've looked at have low levels of foliation. Again, indicating they're probably not moving around very much. What becomes really interesting is regardless of whether they're closely related to each other or not, um, they all share a very similar pattern of brain organization, which is they have large regions of the brain for processing smell and exceptionally huge regions for electroreception and lateral line. Um, and we've suggested this probably reflects the fact that they're specializing in non-visual senses in these deep, dark environments. This becomes even more apparent if we move up out of the deep sea and head, say, into higher light level environments. So like a coral reef, um, which is where you're going to find a lot of our reef sharks. So white tip reef sharks, black tip reef sharks, gray reef. We start to see a very clear shift towards higher levels of foliation, indicating these are probably more active predators. Um, and interestingly, we almost see the complete opposite of what we saw in our deep sea shark brains. So those regions responsible for smell and electroreception are now reduced. And instead, the brain reflects the requirements for living in a spatially complex habitat. So we have enlargement of the regions for things like spatial learning and sociality, as well as vision. All right, the last group we're gonna look at are the ones that are always on the news. So these are gonna be our pelagic sharks. So we have some species that are considered true oceanic or epipelagic, which means they live kind of from the surface down to about 150, 200 meters depth. And then we have those that we consider more continental shelf species. 
If you've been following along, you probably are not going to be surprised. This is where we see the highest levels of foliation. Not only are these our most kind of active agile sharks, but they're also hunting the most active agile prey. What I find really interesting is that there's differences in these two groups in terms of their brain anatomy. So our true oceanic, true pelagic sharks, uh, what we see there are large regions associated with vision and motor control. Not too surprising, they're in this well-lit open ocean habitat and they're hunting active prey. Those on the shelf, um, in addition to having large regions for motor control and vision, they have enormous regions for smell. Um, in particular, species like tiger sharks and white sharks, which have the largest olfactory bulbs of any species that I've looked at. And this makes sense if you think about their ecology, um, and it may just reflect uh, olfactory specialization. So whites and tigers, they are known predators for marine mammals. Um, they're known to follow odor plumes, to um, find dead whale carcasses, for example. Um, so it could potentially just reflect the ability to specialize in tracking odors over long distances. An alternate hypothesis that I find really interesting um, is that these animals may actually be using odor in order to migrate. Um, this is a fairly recent hypothesis, um, but actually is starting to gain a little bit of traction. So for example, whites and tiger sharks, they are definitely known to occur coastally. They also make very long offshore migrations and can come back almost in a straight trajectory to the coast. So it is very possible um, that they may actually, much in the kind of the way we use a GPS or we use visual landmarks um, in order to find our way around, sharks may actually be using olfactory landmarks in order to do this. Uh, we don't have quite enough migratory species to directly test this hypothesis, but this is something that's been coming out in the literature in other animals. So for example, we see large olfactory bulbs um, in migrating seabirds, um, in migratory mammals with very large home ranges, and in bats with really large wingspans. Um, so there is a little bit of evidence that's starting to come out that they may be using olfaction for more than just finding food. Okay, so that was a little bit of a whirlwind tour through the brain. Um, and now I think it's my job as a professor to make sure everyone's been paying attention. So we're gonna have a little quiz. Um, and it's going to be um, in a very unique species. So I've introduced all of this variability. And to me, the most fascinating question is, okay, that's very interesting. But where do species with extreme morphologies or really unique behaviors kind of fit into this puzzle? So enter the whale shark. As we said um, early on, the whale shark is the largest fish in the ocean, lives in the pelagic zone, is known to make vertical migrations in the water column, and feeds exclusively on plankton. So bearing that ecology in mind, we're going to start to make some predictions about what its brain might look like. Uh, I know I gave you, again, a whirlwind summary, so just to kind of review, Remember, we have our benthic sharks. They have sort of that average brain development. In the benthopelagics, we have the reef sharks, which have enlarged regions for um, spatial learning and memory, uh, compared to the deep sea, who have those large regions for electroreception and lateral line. And then we have our pelagic sharks, large regions for motor control and vision, and especially those migratory shelf species with very large olfactory bulbs. Okay, so now comes the quiz. So at home, I'm going to ask each of you kind of to make a hypothesis. So we're going to give you three options. And obviously, I can't see you, unfortunately. But I want you to pick which category you think that the whale shark brain is going to fall into. So first thing, do you think it's going to be more similar um, to other pelagic sharks? So species like, say, a mako shark. Or do you think it's going to be more similar to closely related species? So whale sharks are a member of the Erectolobiformes order. So is its brain going to look like a close relative, like say the ornate wabagong? Third option and final is, do you think it's going to look more like other large bodied species that feed exclusively on plankton? So you don't have to tell me your answer, but just keep it in your mind. We're going to see if you're right. So um, to 
sort of introduce the brain to you, I also have to introduce a new method. Uh, so for very, very rare samples that you don't want to dissect, um, a great technique to use is something called magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. And MRI is pretty amazing in its ability to give you very high resolution images of parts of the body. So some of you maybe have even had an MRI done, uh, maybe you've had a knee injury um, or needed a doctor to look inside a part of your body that had an injury. So how MRI works is it basically takes advantage of the fact that our bodies are made up of a lot of water. So a lot of water means a lot of protons. So if you've ever had an MRI done, quick rundown of what was going on when you went in the scanner. Um, essentially, they use a magnetic field to align protons in the body. Um, radio frequency waves sort of get absorbed by those protons and emitted as a signal that can be picked up by a special coil. Um, and then that information gets sent to a computer. So the computer can kind of parse all of that data and create an image. Uh, I would say a simpler way to think about MRI is it's sort of just mapping water and fat in your body. Lucky for me, um, humans are not the only ones whose bodies are made up of water and fat. So this is a great method to also apply to our cartilaginous fish. So for example, you can scan an animal to generate surface renderings of the body as well as get pictures of their internal anatomy. Um, so this is a technique we use a lot in my lab. Um, and it essentially allows me to dissect something without a scalpel. So what you're seeing on the screen, this is a recent MRI image acquisition of the little skate um, made by my PhD student. Um, and you can sort of see the eyes just went through there um, and the brain. So it's an incredibly effective way to look at internal anatomy and get measurements without having to make any cuts. You can kind of import this data into special software um, and then you can do what we call segmentation. So you can get an image of the entire brain and you can dissect digitally different brain regions. So for example, like the cerebellum. And all of a sudden you can ask a whole host of new questions. So we can look at subregions of the cerebellum, which we can compare between species. Um, and now we have 3D data, we can actually do a more rigorous surface analysis of all those folding and actually quantify that. Um, it won't go into that, but um, we have a lot of very interesting data on how we're doing sort of these shape analyses techniques. Okay, so I asked you to make some predictions, so it's only fair that I share mine. Uh, so this was back, I think we looked at these brains back in 2008. At this point in my career, I'd probably seen the brain, I would say about 70 or so species. And so I was pretty cocky. Um, I knew where this animal lived and what it did and what it was related to. So I made some predictions about what I thought the brain would look like. Um, I sort of predicted that we would see about an average telencephalon. They don't live around a reef or other kind of complex habitats. I thought we would probably see reasonably large regions for vision. Um, they're in the open ocean. It's a very well-lit habitat. I thought the cerebellum would be kind of average in size. They're large-bodied, but they're not really active or agile. And where I thought we'd see the greatest enlargement was in those regions for electroreception and lateral line, because I thought it's very possible that they're using um, electric fields to find patches of plankton. So, Predictions are all well and good, right? And then you get the brain. And what you have to confront is the fact that you're really, really wrong. <laughs> really wrong. I don't even think there are words for how wrong I was. Uh, and at first I was really mad, but it actually, I think, and this is something for any budding scientist or anybody who's doing any kind of work uh, where you're looking for those eureka moments, is that actually being wrong is awesome because it forces you to confront some pre-existing assumptions that you might be making. So I got over being wrong and then I got to quantify just how wrong I was, it was super fun. Um, so we imaged the brain and used that special software to segment it into those major brain regions we all now know and love. Um, and the thing that jumped out at me and I hope jumps out at you now that you guys have a bit of insight into neuroanatomy is this huge 
absolutely foliated cerebellum. And this was previously a trait I had only seen in my most active fast swimming sharks. So what on earth was going on? We had to kind of go back to looking at the numbers and comparing relative size of each of these structures. And I'm not going to go into all of the statistics that we use, but essentially if a bar in this graph is facing downwards, it means it's relatively small. If a bar is facing upwards, it means it's relatively large. So the two regions that I predicted would be large, no, not so much. Um, but what I think was going on is it was overshadowed by this absolutely enormous cerebellum, which also had a very high level of foliation. And again, I had only seen this trait before in very active, agile swimmers. Whale shark, not so active or agile. However, they are pelagic species, and they are known to make very long distance migrations as well as vertically migrate in the water column. Um, and I want you to remember back when I was talking about how there's sort of that functional debate on the cerebellum. What was really cool in this case about being wrong is that we could actually help inform that debate. So it may not just be that the cerebellum is strictly about active agile motor control, but it may have more to do with coordinating a very large body in 360 degree space. So it could have more to do with things like habitat dimensionality, sensory acquisition, um, and proprioception or balance than we previously thought. Okay, so I confessed how wrong I was. Um, now time to see who at home was wrong. Um, so again, I don't know what your predictions were, but just for yourself, if you predicted the brain would look most like a close relative like the wabagong, unfortunately, not so much. If you predicted the brain would look like another pelagic shark, like say a mako, sorry, wrong again. For those of you who are way smarter than me and <laughs> predicted that the brain would look most similar to the basking shark, bang, full credit, 100%. Um, it is remarkably similar. And again, I'm not gonna talk you through the statistics, but statistically speaking, the brain of the whale shark was most similar to the basking shark. These are not closely related species at all. They belong to very different orders, um, but they have evolved very similar brains as well as very similar lifestyles. So in the paper that we published on this, uh, we suggested that this is showing good evidence for convergent evolution in the brain of these two species where the brain enlargement of various structures and their complexity is the most statistically similar between two distantly related species um, that share similar lifestyles. So that was just a little snapshot into some of the work um, that we do in my lab, uh, where my students and I are kind of continuing to ask these types of questions. Um, we are always um, adding new species to our data set. Some of our most recent work was on the brain of the Greenland shark, uh, where we are actually able to start to make predictions about behaviors in species that are really difficult to study in the wild. So like the Greenland shark that lives under the ice in the Arctic, not exactly the most accessible habitat in the world. Um, in addition to looking across species, we also have a number of studies looking at how the brain varies in a single species. There are actually considerable changes that happen in the brain as that shark goes from a juvenile to an adult. So we have some papers that are in review right now looking at whether those changes in the brain correspond to ecological changes these animals make as they age. Um, and then the other side of it is how are these animals able to cope with environmental changes? So we have changes between species, we have changes throughout life in a single species, and we're also investigating what happens to brain development when faced with um, environmental perturbations. So a huge one that is of course on everyone's mind is the overall warming of our planet. Um, so as we know, sea surface temperatures risen by about Point five degrees in the last century and is predicted to rise another one to four degrees by the year 2100. So we are currently investigating how these elevated temperatures and changes in pH are impacting brain development. 
and our pilot data is showing these animals are susceptible and unfortunately it is impacting development of their brain. But watch this space. So I will end today kind of the way that I started, um, which is with my least favorite question. Um, and I think in a weird way I set myself up because I actually don't have an answer for you. But that's what I think is awesome about science is that in a weird way, I hope I never have an answer. I kind of hope it continues to sort of grow and change and I keep challenging my own predictions. Um, but between you and me, I think that sharks may be smarter than we give them credit for. But I will keep you posted. So thank you so much to Dr. McComb for inviting me and um, Oceans First. This has been a really wonderful experience and I would absolutely love to take any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, that's amazing. I'm like, there, I, one, of our, one of our questions was actually not a question. One of our attendees said, there's just so much to learn and put a little brain blown emoji. It was great. Um, <laughs> um, we have a question um, about shark brains though. Do sharks brains differences correlate to the differences in their denticles? In their denticles? That's a really interesting question. It's actually not one that I have questioned. I know there's a lot of variability in denticles and that's also I think something that can change throughout ontogeny. Um, but no, unfortunately not something that I've looked at directly. Um, it is a, potentially a question that we could explore in the future though. It's a good question. Um, Dr. Yopak, I'm wondering if you could stop sharing your screen so we can see you a little bit. Oh, here. of course. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. Yay. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, well, thank you for that amazing uh, talk. That was really, uh, there's just so much there to unpack and to think about. Uh, it was really, uh, really amazing to hear about how your research has just grown and um, <laughs> taken some twists and turns. And uh, I really found the basking shark um uh correlation there it, you know it's form and function that was amazing yep, yep. it's really interesting it makes so much sense but yeah. it 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 didn't fit within the the kind of the data that we had at the time but i loved i mean i did not love that at first but i love <laughs> that now <laughs> i think it's a really important lesson that just be ready to be wrong and that that's okay and i think every species that i get it sort of again challenges what we know because it's going to slightly change things and sometimes you open up a cranium and you think i didn't expect that <laughs> not even a little so yeah it's, it's been really exciting that's great and um so what do you think is happening um with uh species like hammerheads that have social behaviors and maybe even social hierarchies in their schools uh that we see and uh, perhaps I think you even alluded to navigation and I didn't even know about olfactory navigation that that's amazing. I didn't really know about that, but thinking about all the, all the tasks that hammerheads do, um, it, it's really fascinating to look at the regions of the brain that are enlarged. Could you maybe tell us a little more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll start with, so I can send you this paper, it's called the Olfactory Spatial Hypothesis. And there's some really interesting ideas on how, if animals are using smell to link locations in kind of olfactory space, if you will, then the idea is that, okay, so then their olfactory regions of the brain should kind of covary with navigational demand. And we're seeing this in several different vertebrate groups. And like I kind of said in the talk, I don't have enough species yet to really test that. Mm -hmm. But at the very least, the largest olfactory bulbs we're seeing are in our most migratory sharks. Uh, and there's some work, um, some behavioral work um, by Andy Nozel, who was showing the, uh, I think it was his leopard sharks, and they were juveniles, but if they were displaced from their nursery, they could find their way back unless their noses were plugged. Um, and I know uh, Jed, and I know Jane Gardner is finding similar behavioral things on, on at least the importance of olfaction for short distance navigation. So I find that whole concept so, so interesting and, and sort of taking the human centric approach out because we're like, well, we don't use smells in that way. Um, but I think animals may be using these cues in different ways than, than we think. Uh, and 
Hammerheads, you picked up on my favorite brain. Um, so I have two favorites. One is Hammerhead and one is Thresher Shark. And I always joke that I think I like the sharks that I'm sure get picked on on the shark playground when they're little. So I like, <laughs> I love the weirdos. Um, and the Hammerhead brain is huge and fascinating. Um, and a lot of what I kind of think of as higher cognitive functions, so social complexity, um, navigating very spatially complex environments, um, that's sort of kind of modulated by this big protrusion here. Um, without nerding out too much about anatomy, you can almost see like a little divot. So there's this region, uh, it's called the central nucleus of the dorsal pallium, and it's incredibly expanded um, in our hammerhead sharks. And actually you also see a protrusion of that in reef sharks, so very social species. So there, there's a lot of very interesting, I think, complex cognitive processing that's happening in these animals, and we've really only been able to kind of scratch the surface of it. And that's interesting too, because hammerheads are believed to be the most recently evolved sharks, and they have that interesting brain correlating to it. So that's that's uh, that's really fascinating to think about what the future holds uh, for a new shark species. I, I imagine. I know. No, it is. It's really, really interesting. Uh, and I didn't get to go into any of the Batoid work. Um, unfortunately, we just didn't have time for this talk, but there's a whole other really interesting story in Rays and Skates, and Manta brains look really, really similar to this. Um, they're near identical. And so there's something very interesting um, when you've got this expansion um, of the forebrain that kind of is very closely correlated with more derived species, but also species that have kind of that more complex social structure than others. Yeah, and it's, I mean, I, I'm sure you've had the experience, but, you know, diving with manta rays, um, you know, they will come in and they look at you and they examine you, they yep. are interested, they're playful. Yep. So they have uh, characteristics, uh, you know, that are just really surprising for a fish. Uh, yeah. And much appreciated by me. And I have one last thing. Yeah. Threshers, so threshers, that, that blows my mind. So they have big eyes, they have the tail, they're smart, they're, they're making calculations with their tails on tail smacking. For those of you that don't know, threshers have the large tails and they use that as a weapon to stun fish. So that speaks volumes to that particular shark and their, their adaptations that we see in their hunting. Yep, no, I, I also, so threshers are my other favorite. Um, because yeah, I think, and, and what really helped me start to kind of understand the brain was more those outliers that are kind of doing something really unique. Mm -hmm. And with the thresher, um, I think the way that they swim through school of fish and spank it and then eat it is this, it's, but if you think about that, breaking it down, it's a pretty complex motor behavior and their cerebellum's over 30% of their brain. So they have one of the largest cerebellums of species that I've looked at um, for their body size, which, Again, it makes so much sense um, in terms of thinking about their ecology. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, Jenna, are there some more questions? I don't think so. I think we just had a lot of comments about how fascinating this was. I really <laughs> oh, wanted yeah. to learn more. Minds are all blown. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> my melted. Melted. I learned so much. Um, well, I'm wondering if there's anything you can say to um, aspiring uh, marine biologists or or even female uh, scientists in the making who are really inspired by what you've done with your career and um, how you said being wrong has been a big challenge and I, I can't agree more with that that you know being wrong is kind of it sucks but it really does push you to think about new questions and try to it's you're a sleuth you're a detective you're a yep. shark detective and and it's really amazing so do you have anything you'd like to share yeah, I, I would first say with, with being wrong, I think you get better at it as you get a little older, um, but it is so important to be ready to be wrong. And I think one of the proudest moments ever was when one of my students pointed out a typo in one of my papers and that it was, it was a mathematical calculation and they were so scared. And I was like, that's great. Like <laughs> you need to read all the papers you read really critically and you need to think about um, you know, how you're going to push the field forward. And I think as educators, as supervisors, we just need to be ready to be wrong yeah. because the next generation is going to come on, build on what we have, but also improve upon it. 
Um, and if, you know, if, if you guys don't do that, then what I do doesn't matter. You know, I, I don't want it just to end and say, I am right and nobody can change what I have said. Um, <laughs> I guess if I had advice, um, so I was that kid at five years old who said I was going to be an ichthyologist who studies sharks, like Eugenie Clark. I, was, I knew how to spell ichthyologist at five. Um, and I think the best thing that my mother did for me was she just bought me books. And so I read every book, everybody in my, I mean, I'm going to date myself here, but all my classmates were reading Nancy Drew and I was reading the shark attack files. Like I could not get enough. Um, and I think for young people, take that thing that sparks you. I mean, I think it's true for you. It's true for me. I love going to work. I, I get paid to, to do the thing that I love. Um, and the second piece of advice is follow opportunities. So I think sometimes we can have a limited scope of what we're capable of. Um, and when I finished my undergrad, uh, I knew I wanted to get a PhD and it came down to having um, two different opportunities. One was closer to home and one was in New Zealand. And the one that was closer to home was fantastic, um, you know, but it was, it was working on lobster olfaction. And I, it, it would have been great, but my passion was just in sharks. And as, you know, 22 years old, two suitcases moving across the world, it was the scariest thing that I'd ever done. But I think you have to be ready to take advantage of those opportunities. And what I learned there, I, I mean, I, I can't even recommend enough that you, you travel, you get new perspectives, you gain all these experiences. Uh, yeah, so I've lived in three countries and it was incredible. And now I have these amazing international collaborators um, that I wouldn't have otherwise. So, so yeah, follow the spark and take advantage of opportunities, even if it's outside of your kind of geographical ideal, because it might end up being even better. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> Hey, we do actually have a question that came in while you were talking about okay. following your passion. Um, that's really specific, actually. It's about if deep sea shark brains like goblin sharks are different from shallow water sharks. That's a good question. And absolutely, yes. So part of that, I cannot say, but goblin shark is so on my brain wish list. I may be the only person in the world who has a brain wish list, but that's on it. Um, yeah, so deep sea sharks, what's really, really interesting is sort of, and this is true of deep sea sharks, deep sea batoids, and deep sea chimeras, is you see very small brains at overall size, but very large lobes that receive input from the electroreceptors. Mm -hmm. So you, got, you have this recession of the visual brain specifically, and then this expansion of regions kind of for the non-visual senses. You'll also see expansion of the regions for smell, um, which not quite as large as, as those migratory sharks, but they're definitely statistically large. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's really, really interesting and very, very clear. Uh, I can send you the paper we did on the deep sea species. Very different from the shallow water species. They're in higher light level environments. Uh, we've got kind of very different specializations that you see in, in those species, but the the deep sea species, you could randomly pick any brain of any deep sea shark and I could probably just look at it and go, yeah, that, that's a deep sea shark. Absolutely, without a doubt. <laughs> so fascinating. I wish we had hours to spend with you. <laughs> <laughs> you can, I mean, when restrictions are lifted, my lab, come see, we have so many amazing <laughs> samples. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, uh, Dr. Yopak, thank you so much for taking time. I know uh, you're busy and you have a lot going on with all your students and all of uh, your teaching and everything. So we're very grateful um, for having you on today. And uh, it was, it's just been a pleasure. I've learned so much and I know everyone else has too. So thank you uh, so much for taking your time. And uh, yeah, thank no you. Worries. This was really fun and I hope everybody's watching enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, feel free to, if you have follow up questions, no problem. Um, you can route them through Ocean First and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, Jenna, do you have any last words? I don't think so. Just that if people do wanna follow up because it seems like the questions are coming a little bit slower. Um, 
because there's so much to absorb, we <laughs> route those to Dr. Yopek and, and we can respond. So feel free to email us at Ocean First or go to our website um, or even our Facebook. You can add that in the comments at any time and we're happy to reach out to her. Okay, so please do. Have a completely yeah, different we'll, perspective. <laughs> yeah, that, that's great. And we'll post this uh, video so you can watch it again if you want to and take notes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much, everybody. Have a wonderful uh, rest of your week. And thanks again, Dr. Yopak. I appreciate it. Of course. Bye, okay. everybody. Bye-bye.